again. This is Wendy Miyadon, and we're going to continue with Fasica 20, 2012. Now, we had um, left off teaching on Fasica. Fasica, which in Hebrew is called Pesach, Pesach, right? Now, that is known as, quote, Passover, because they say the death angel, the death angel passed over the houses or the family of the Beta Israel, and no firstborns died. But among the Egyptians, the firstborn of the Egyptians died. And this was this was the the tenth, what's known as the tenth um Mekshefit Mekshefit or Mekshefit, the tenth of the plagues. Now we had left off speaking about Easter. And now, is it Passover or Easter? Well, first of all, it's not Easter. The only place that Easter occurs is in, turn your Bibles to Acts of the Apostles, chapter 12, verse, um, verse, let's see, chapter 12, verse 4. Chapter 12, verse 4. This is the fifth persecution and the arrest of Petros, the arrest of Peter. Right? Turn, Take a moment. Turn your Bibles there. Acts of the Apostles, chapter, let's just say Passover or, right, or Easter. Now, Easter is really Aster. You understand? Is Aster. Some might try to even say S. Esther or Ishtar, and Ishtar was a a pagan or a heathen festival, a fertility festival. Now this is a fertility goddess, right, or a fertility diva. Let's say it in a language that most folks today can understand. You know, you got divas running around today. Because mm -hmm. as it was in the beginning, so shall it be in the end. And this new age that we're coming into, that we've already got a fourth taste of, but we're coming into, especially the, the this pivotal time, uh, December 21st, 2012, is, is significant, not just from the Mayan calendar, but in the biblical and the spiritual cycle of things. Now, prior to, of course, May not May, but uh, what was was it December twenty first? Is April? Is April season? Is the is what's called the spring equinox? Now, why the spring equinox? Because we are children of the light. We're not children of the darkness. We are children of the light. So, as Beta Israel, this high holy day. This is one of the key and the most important. Um, feasts and festivals for the Beta Israel, for the ethnic Hebrews and Jews, as well as for true Christian, for the true Christians. This this is a metasebia, it's a memorial. It's not Easter. First of all, let's go to, have you turned your Bibles there to Acts of the Apostles? So the only place we find this, this pseudo, um, this pseudo use, Easter, because you probably heard a lot of people talk about Easter is coming, Easter, Easter, uh, Easter egg and Easter bunny, so forth and so on. Those people have been lied to and deceived. Some even know the truth but are willing to go with the deception. But most folks don't know the truth. They're following traditions of men and people and, and things they've gotten used to and indoctrinated since they were children, but they never really learn the truth for themselves. Now, some will say Easter, and they'll point to Acts of the Apostles, Acts 12 and 4. So we're going to go to Acts of the Apostles, 
12 and 4. The verses on Passover in the Bible are so many, so numerous, that we don't have space here to name it. But the only one for Easter or Aster or Ishtar, the fertility goddess, or also by extension the Ashtarot, the false goddesses, the false divas, is here in Acts 12 and 4. And here in the King James Bible, this is one of the mistranslations in the King James Bible, so make a note of it. In Acts chapter 12, verse 4, it says, And when he had apprehended him, he put him in prison and delivered him to four quaternions of soldiers to keep him, intending after Easter to bring him forth to the people. Now, in the Schofield Study Bible, there's a G. There's a G next to Easter. So if we look in the, in the, um, the center margin, it says the Passover. The Passover. So in good Bibles, like a Schofield Study Bible, it will clearly tell you that this Easter, which was put in the King James Bible because half the people were still pagan and holding to paganism and heathenism, and half of the people were seeking to come out of paganism and, and heathenism. So this was a very subtle, a subtle insertion of the enemy, you understand, by putting this word Easter in there. Because once they could put that word Easter in there, then they could put Easter eggs and Easter bunnies. But when you really study Easter and go back to its, its uh, heathen and goy, the Goy, the Goyan, the Gentile, the nations. This is, this is not a Beta Israel. It's not a Christian holy day. It is a counterfeit and a fraud. And preachers, pastors, or, or other folks out there who think they know the Bible, and they say, well, it's here in the Bible right here. Um, what does the margin say? Have you studied uh, have you studied to show yourself approved? It tells you clearly that this is Passover. This is the Passover. So we do not observe Easter. Mm -hmm. So hands, hands down, basically, or hands off of Easter, what we apprehend and hold on to is the Fasica, is the Passover. You know what I'm saying? And the Passover, Fasica, Pesach is a memorial. Now we're in Exodus chapter, Exodus chapter twelve. Isn't it interesting? This is Acts of the Apostle chapter twelve too. We just, you know, we we, we see those um, those um, those like many signs, but still there are signs in the scripture. We see that there. It's just, it's just interesting. Not going to make a big thing about it, you know, if there's no big thing to be made about it. But when Acts of the Apostle chapter twelve, but the foundation of this particular Torah portion reading and feeding for us is is Exodus. Exodus. And we hope that brothers and sisters and others will be exiting exodusing out of these Babylon, these Babylonian mystery Babylon. When we say mystery Babylon is speaking of 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 spiritual church matters because most folks who are churchy Christians, church and so forth and so on, they observe this, this Easter thing. And if you ask them where did Easter come from, it, it's a mystery to them. They, they don't know. All they know is that since they were a little boy or girl, they were painting Easter eggs, boiling eggs, painting them, going on Easter egg hunts, and there's an Easter bunny, so forth and so on. But what they don't know <laughs> is what they don't know, that, that Easter is not a holy day for us. That even in the, if you look it up, they'll tell you in their dictionary that there is no in, indication of the observance of the Easter festival in the New Testament, besides the bad translation or mistranslation here in Acts of the Apostles, chapter 12, verse 4, which better Bibles, like the Schofield, even have corrected or put in the margin to state that Easter is really the Pesach, or it, it is the Passover. Now, in addition to that, we can ask, well, how did this Easter thing get started? 
how did this Easter thing get started? And we can lay the blame for this basically on counterfeit Christianity and um, papal papalism, popery, basically, because they figured that they wanted to appeal to all of the pagans and heathens and people who were worshiping other gods because they were dealing with universalism. That's what Catholicos mean, universalism. Kataholos really means above all, but that's been interpreted in Latin to be um, Catholicos means universal. If you recall earlier when we were in um, the Schofield notes, let's go back to the foundational scripture. The foundational scripture is Exodus chapter 12. If you go back to Exodus chapter 12, there's a footnote down here. And the footnote, when it's talking about the blood, how the blood is applied, this answers to the appropriation by personal faith, and it refutes, it refutes universalism, this, this really Catholicism. It refutes Catholicism. It's interesting when we put that together and then we connect together this, this Easter thing. You know, and this is not for ones to malign those poor brothers and sisters and others out there who have been hoodwinked and bamboozled into observing these pagan feasts as an article of faith and, and religion, just tell them to read and study the Bible for themselves, to find the truth for themselves, and remind them that Christ says, you shall know the truth. If you don't know how Easter got in there and what Easter is about, is it Easter or Passover? It's very clear that it's Fasica, or it's, it's Passover, Pesach, and not Easter. Mm -hmm. Because if you observe Easter... You're not observing Passover, and you're not observing the true memorial of the Lord's Supper. You're observing a, a, a heathen, a Goyim festival, which is a fertility festival that is connected with certain lewd and lascivious uh, sexual rites. You know, a strip club, you know, and all of this sexualism that's going on now is nothing in compare to what the heathens did when they worship their false gods, demons, basically, in disguise. But how did Easter get started? Well, first of all, like we've been saying, it's rooted in the Ishtar, Ashtaroth, paganistic um, worship, you understand, or idolatry. Now, this folly day, which they call a holiday, but they shouldn't dare call it a holy day, but they call it a, a whole lie day, is supposed to commemorate Jesus' resurrection. That's what they tell you. They say, well, Passover, it commemorates the resurrection of Jesus. And then they give you a white picture. So you see, so you see how they just compound, how they compound the judgment. You know, they add one little thing here, then they add something else here. Remember, with the blood applied, nothing else is to be added. When they, when they applied the bl blood to the doorpost, nothing else was to be added. You understand? But you see what they have done with Easter, which they say commemorates Christ's resurrection. But really, if we study for ourselves, we find that Christ, Jesus, or Jesus, if you please, Yeshua, he observed Fasica. He observed Pesach. He observed Passover as it's written in the law of Moses. But he upgraded it. Yeshua upgraded Fasica and Pesach. And in this 2012 Passover, there's one more important upgrade to begin the wheels of coming out of Babylon and our exodus. And the key connection is Jeremiah chapter 23, verses 7 and 8. You see, but if you read Jeremiah 23, verses 7 and 8, you need to have the background foundation, which is Fasica, which is Pesach. But let's just deal with this Easter bunny thing for a moment, all right? So they tell you that Easter, it commemorates Jesus' resurrection. The customs that are associated with the Easter season are not Christian, they, they are Antichrist. So Easter really, right, let's, let's just show this right here. Easter, no Easter, Easter is really not of Christ. See, Passover is of 
let's put this here, Passover is of Christ, right? Easter right here is of Antichrist. I know it may be hard for some to believe, but study the truth and know the truth for yourself and you know, what do you know? Do you know this or do you believe it or are you just following men and people who themselves don't know, you know, what to believe or what to follow but are following tradition and customs, you know? Um, when you check out the Easter Bunny thing, for example, Easter Bunny, can you please, if it commemorates Christ's resurrection, can you please show me, or better yet, show yourself where this bunny, can you find bunny in the Bible? Even the new, these funny Bibles, these new Bibles, can you find bunny in the Bible? You never know, they might actually put it in the Bible after this goes, this goes viral, but you can't find bunny in the Bible. You understand? But they say that Easter commemorates Christ, Jesus' resurrection, then we should be able to find bunny in the Bible. Otherwise, why do they have the Easter bunny? There's no Passover bunny, you know? We're not trying to be funny, but this is trying to be truthful, honest. The rabbit, and you know, we checked out the Catholic Encyclopedia, and even the Catholic Encyclopedia says it. What does the Catholic Encyclopedia say? The Catholic Encyclopedia, even the Catholics will tell you. <laughs> you know, it's interesting. They, they will institute a lie, but if you read their own books, their own books will tell you many times the truth. The own books will tell you that we know this is a lie, but it, it works for the people, you know. And, and, you know, anyway, they say if you want to hide something, just put it in the book. I guess that's been working for a long time. The rabbit is a pagan heathen symbol and has always been an emblem, an emblem of fertility. Now, when you, we, we now connect the, the bunny with, with, with Easter and with Aster, or the Ashtarot and Ishtar, you know what I'm saying? You can just see how lewd, lascivious, and how vulgar. It's, it's vulgar. It is extremely vulgar. But most folks think, oh, they paint pretty eggs and so forth and so on, but they don't understand what the act that they partake in is really emulating. You know, why do the children, why do children have to go look in, in, in groves for eggs. What are they looking for? Why are they find these? Uh, and what's that bunny all about? What, what's all this about? What's the connection about? One thing we know it's not about, it's not about Christ, plain and simple. It is not in the Bible. It's not in the scripture, Yovas. It's not Hebrew. It's not Jewish. It's not Christian. And for us as Ethiopian Hebrews, the beauty about it is that if you look in our our history as Ethiopian Christians, it's like there's no Easter because that's a white Western Roman thing, you know. But unfortunately, there's many careless Ethiopians today who are observing um, Easter. But a word to the wise should be sufficient. So I want us to touch on this right here, you know, to make this kind of um, very clear, that when we're speaking about Fasica and Pesach, we're speaking about Passover. We're speaking about Christ. We're speaking about the Moshi, the Moshi, the Moshiach. We're not speaking about Easter, Aster, Ashtaroth, Ishtar, or Antichrist. Yes, you find Acts 12 and 4 in, in, in Bibles and in King James Bibles. It says Easter in it, but if you look at the marginal note, the marginal note will tell you the Passover. So that should be very clear. In, in itself, and there's, there's no Passover bunny, so, you know, we, you know, you could pass over the bunny, you know, there's no Passover bunny, but now, what is, this is the question now for us, what is Fasica about, and how do we observe it, or better yet, how should we observe it, well, first of all, Exodus chapter 12 is required reading and study. Yovas, those points, the main points concerning the Passover is a type of Christ, and Christ is our what? He's our Redeemer. You understand? Our Redeemer. So let's put 
redeemer. Our soul redeemer. You understand? Our soul redeemer. Now, the redemption of Israel did not happen at the advent or during the ministry or the Passover, crucifixion, or resurrection of our black Lord and Savior, Jesus Christos. Now, how do we know that? We know that because as we touched on the Emmaus Road, let's get back to this for a moment. Let's go forward, rather, to this for a moment. In Luke's Gospel, let's go to Luke chapter, Luke chapter 24, right? In Luke chapter 24, you remember the, the Emmaus Road, when they were walking on the Emmaus Road, right? When they walk on the Emmaus Road, this is after the the um, resurrection of Jesus Christos, the ministry of the risen Christ, and there were certain disciples who were from a village or a region that was known as Emmaus. And we touched on this before, and let's, let's find this area right here. As they were walking and talking together, okay, it's verse 21 right here. Now, let's put this in the context of those who didn't pick up on it before. I'll just go over this once again. Verse 13, um, Luke chapter 24, verse 13. And behold, two of them went that same day to a village called Emmaus, which was from Jerusalem about three score furlongs, about 60 furlongs or 500. One furlong is about 582 feet. So times that by 60, you understand? And you can get the distance that Emmaus, the village of Emmaus, was from Jerusalem. Verse 14, and they talked together of all these things which had happened concerning the crucifixion, concerning the, the death, burial, the resurrection of Jesus, of Yeshua, right? And the empty tomb. And it came to pass that while they communed together, and reasoned, Iesus, Iusus, Yeshua himself drew near and went with them, verse 16, but their eyes were holding, but their eyes were held back from apprehending that it was Yeshua, that they should not know him. Verse 17, and he said to them, what manner of communications are these that ye have one to another as ye walk? And I said, this is what Yeshua said to the disciples, the Emmaus disciples. And, and we're going to learn why they were sad, just like why many of us might be sad or feel disillusioned, because they had half the truth, but they didn't have the whole truth. They, they, they had lacked the foundation, and that was scriptures. This is what we learn in this, in this last chapter of Luke's Gospel that the key element that they needed now, they were there. They witnessed these things. They were there at the time. So, you know, they were like eyewitnesses, and still they were disillusioned. Now Christ appears to them, but they don't know it's him. You understand? And he asks them, what manner of communications are these that ye have one to another as ye walk and are sad? Verse 18, and one of them, whose name was Cleopas, answering said to him, Art thou only a stranger in Jerusalem, and hast not known the things which are come to pass in these days? And he said to them, and Christ said to them, What things? Now, if you read this in the Red Letter Bible, it's interesting because the Red Letter shows Christ speaking, and so, so, so you'll see how limited his speaking was, but how powerfully to the point it was. But let's hear the disciples. And they said to him, concerning Jesus the Nazaretu, concerning Jesus of Nazareth, which was a prophet mighty indeed and word before God and all the people. Now, this is interesting. They considered the Emmaus disciples, who were disciples. Remember, we touched on disciples in John chapter 6. So that's, that's also very important, too. Because some of the disciples had, because they could not receive, they could not accept the teachings, they went away. They walked back in, in John chapter 6, verse 66. 
you know, because they did not, they were not able to apprehend the word or receive the word as it was taught. And discipleship is tested by timherit, by doctrine, by the teaching. Both, both, if you're a disciple, then you're learning the teaching. Then you can speak the teaching, you can articulate the teaching, as well as live the teaching, you understand, or seek to. And, and practice makes perfect. That's the key. He says, be perfect as our Abba, as Abba is perfect. And how, they went on, he went on, Cleopas went on, and how the chief priests and our rulers delivered him to be condemned to death and have crucified him. Now, who was it? It wasn't the common people that crucified Christ, but it was the chief priests, the religious guys, the religious authorities, and our rulers and those who are ruling our secular rulers, who delivered him to be condemned to death and have crucified him. Now, here's the verse, verse 21. But we, Cleopas is saying, we as disciples, as the Emmaus clique, you know, and others also, we trusted that it had been he. We trusted, we, 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 our main, we had our main that it had been he. Notice they didn't say, there's no Jesus Christ here. There's Jesus of Nazareth. There's no, he is the Messiah. You understand? There's no, he is the king of Israel. No. There's that he was a prophet. You understand? And he was mighty in deed and word before God and all the people. Now, here in verse 21, they say, but we trusted that it had been he. We trusted that it had been he which should have redeemed Israel. I want you, if you're reading that and studying that, highlight that part right there in chapter 24 of Luke's Gospel, verse 21, where he said that, but we trusted that it had been he, who, he, which should have redeemed Israel. And beside all this, today, is the third day since these things were done. And they're going to go on and say, Yea, and certain women also of our company, in other words, certain women who are also down with us, as the, so there were female disciples too, uh, there were certain women who were of our company, they were called holy women, in other words, but they were still of the company of disciples, made us astonished. And which were early at the sepulchre. In other words, they, they, they surprised us. They were at the sepulchre early, and, and the stories they were telling. And when they found not his body, they came saying that they had also seen a vision of angels which said that he was alive. Can you believe this? So, where, strangers, where are you from? Remember, they're speaking to Yeshua, but they don't know it's Yeshua, right? And certain of them which were with us went to the sepulcher, which is the tomb, and found it even as the woman had said, and found that what the woman was saying, you know, trust, but verify. So they trusted what the woman, though, though it was kind of surprising, but let's go check this out anyway. And when they went to check it out, they say right here that it was as the woman had said, but him they saw not, but him they saw not. They didn't see him there, and they didn't recognize the one that was talking to them was he. You understand? Because he did not reveal or unveil himself. You understand? So when people talk about the second coming of Jesus, really it's the parousia, it's the unveiling, it's the ap uh, ap ap apocalypse or the, the, the revelation of Yeshua that we actually um look for, but we know that he's with us, he's with us always, even to the end of this age, right? Right. Now, verse 25, it says, then he said to them, oh, fools, what? Christ called them fools. <laughs> you know, I, I smile because I think about the way he said that, don't call your brother, you know, fool, but Christ called them fools. Because were they being brotherly? Not in the teaching of his majesty. They wasn't being brotherly here. Oh, fools, and slow of heart, and slow of consciousness 
slow of heart to believe or better, my men to our main, to trust, in other words, all that the prophets have spoken. Notice how they translate the word trust here. And they translate the word believe there. But if you go back, it's, it's amen. It's ma-men. Even in the Hebrew, it's ma-men. In the Ethiopic, in the Amharic, it's ma-men. At the root, it's the amen. And the amen is a person. The amen is Christ. Revelation chapter 3, verse 14. So they said in verse 21, but we trusted in amen. Uh, na-amen. Naamen, Naamen, you know what I'm saying? We trusted that it had been he which should have what? Redeemed this Israel. Now, if you go to, to Acts of the Apostle, they repeat the same thing about the redemption of Israel. And Christ told them, listen, you have, you have other matters to focus on. That's going to happen in its due time. You know what I'm saying? And just to prove it, let's just prove this to you, that Christ, Yeshua, the Bain Ha Elohim did not redeem Israel. So who 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 who's gonna redeem Israel? The King of Kings has redeemed Israel. The Father has redeemed Israel. Right here, he the, in, in Acts of the Apostles, chapter one. This is the resurrection ministry of Christ, and says, To whom also he shewed himself alive after his passion by many infallible proofs. In other words, he proved it over and over by many infallible, not just one thing, but many proofs, infallible proofs, being seen of them forty days, and speaking of the things pertaining to the kingdom of God, to the Mengishta to the kingdom of Ha Elohim, and being assembled together with them, commanded them that they should not depart from Yerushalayim or Jerusalem, but wait. Don't depart yet from the holy city, but wait for the what promise, the tesfa, the expansion of the of the Father, the tesfa of the Ab. Which, saith he, ye have heard from me. So he said, first, wait here. He says, for John, Johannes, truly baptized of water, but ye shall be baptized with the Memphis Kedus, the Ruach HaKodesh, with the Holy Spirit. Here in the Bible, your Bible, it has Holy Ghost. That part, sometimes you either mentally or otherwise strike out that ghost and put spirit there because that's another uh, era of, 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 of of, of Jacob, of King James, right? It says, um, he says, now, John truly baptized with water, but ye, you all, and I and I all must be baptized with the Memphis Caduce not many days hence. And when, it says, when they therefore came together, were come together, they asked of him, saying, I don't need, I don't need, Lord, Master, Hebrew master, wilt thou at this time restore again the kingdom to Israel? That's the key right there. The restoring of the kingdom. Remember, Israel then were living like, well, a little bit better, but the same as niggas are living now. We're, we're, we're under a foreign, a Gentile, a Roman government and a Roman authority. We we don't have we're not sovereign, and they were not sovereign. Yeah, they were in Judea, so forth and so on. But they were under you could say like house arrest. We uh, consequently and vis a vis are in spiritual Egypt. You understand? We are we are like hostages. You understand? In a foreign or a foreign land. But the question they asked was, Lord, wilt thou at this time restore again the kingdom to Israel? They're speaking on the same thing that the Emmaus disciples were speaking on in Luke chapter 24, verse 21, where they say, but we trusted that it had been he which should have redeemed Israel. That it should be he who redeemed Israel. The redemption, they were not looking at the spiritual redemption. They were not looking at the, 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 the psychological, the psychic, or, the, or the, the suke, the soul redemption. They were looking at the physical redemption. We want to have our own king. You know what I'm saying? We want to have our, like, King David. You know, we want to be, you know, in our own kingship, you know, to have our king upon the throne of David, so forth and so on. But 
they ask, therefore, when will, will you at this time restore again? So the kingdom, Israel was there, but no kingdom. There was no king on that throne. You understand? But the Bible says he will always have a king to sit on his throne. You understand? Because the kingdom authority had been transferred to the biblical land of Cush or Ethiopia since Menelik, the queen of Sheba, and King Solomon, the kingdom of David was renewed in Ethiopia, fulfilling the word of the Psalms and the prophet, in particular, Psalm 68, verse 31. Princes shall come out of Egypt. Ethiopia shall stretch forth her hands to God. And this has come to pass. But Israel did not have that kingship. Remember, there was a wide diaspora. There was a diaspora even then. So there were some who were in the land, but many who were, who were scattered about, some in Egypt, some in Syria, some were in, in Greece, some were in Rome, some were in um, what I guess they call uh, Turkey today, you understand? Some were in North Africa, some were in, in East Africa. Some were in Ethiopia, some were probably further south, like the Lemba people, some were in Yemen, you understand? Some were probably still in Iran, and even as far as China, for real, you know, that's where Israel was scattered. Remember, Yah's word was that he would scatter them, but there was a small remnant that was allowed to return. And these people here in that in that land, in, in, in Israel, Judea, were those who were saying, will you now restore again the kingdom to Israel? They still are speaking on the terms of the redemption that was to be fulfilled and was fulfilled by Kedemawi Haile Selassie in 1930. And he said to them, it is not for you to know the times or seasons which the Father Abba has put in his own power, in his own shaltane, in his own authority. That's what it's speaking of. It's not speaking of the Deuteronomy's physical power or, or, or that power, but power in the sense of his authority. So he says, not for you to know those things. He says, but ye shall receive power, the, not authority power, but higher power, but God's power. After that, the Memphis Caduce, the Holy Spirit, is come upon you, and ye shall be witnesses, be witnesses to me in Jerusalem and in Judea and in Samaria and to the uttermost parts of the earth. And when he had spoken these things, while they beheld, while they were looking, he was taken up, and a cloud received him out of their sight. Do we have something somewhat extraterrestrial here? Well, certainly. You understand? Well, certainly we have something extraterrestrial here. But over this, my brothers and sisters, if, if they did not understand the basic scriptures... So these things were even more inarticulable for them. And how do we know it? We're going to return to Luke. Let's go back to Luke, for, forward to Luke. So when, when Yeshua says, O fools and slow of heart to my men to trust all that the prophets have spoken, ought not the Moshiach, ought not Christos, ought not Christ to have suffered these things, the Lamb, which was without blemish, but it was tested. It was, it, was, it was slain. You understand? Its blood was applied to suffer these things and to enter into his glory, to enter into... You see, what, what, what a lot of folks are, 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 are misunderstanding is that word glory right there. You understand? Glory is honor. But, the, but in this context concerning the Moshiach, concerning Christ, the glory is speaking of the Shekinah, the Shekinah, the, the Shekinah, the Sekinah. The Sekinah was that, that, that cloud that covered the Ark of the Covenant, that went up from the Ark of the Covenant whenever the praises of the Beta Israel were acceptable 
with the Spirit of God, there was there was that, that light and that luminosity, that cloud, like the, like the pillar of fire, you know, uh, of, of the Beit Israel above the Ark of the Covenant. So when it said that he went up into a cloud, it was no ordinary cloud. It was the shock and awe or the Sekena cloud, you understand, or the Shekinah, the Shekinah cloud, actually. So when you, you, have, when you understand his glory, his glory, you, you see, and, and we're going to have that connection, but here's the main point that we want to just connect with this, this particular part of the teaching here is in verse 27, and it says, and beginning at Moses and all of the prophets. Remember, remember he, just, he, just, he, just, um, he just called them out. He called them out, I don't know if you'll say on the carpet, um, if you could say on, on, on the dirt road, he called them out where they were walking, saying, You're fools and slow of heart to accept as true all that the prophets have spoken. Ought not the Moshiach to have suffered these things and to enter into his glory? And then it says in verse 27, And beginning, Berashit, Berashit, beginning in the head, Berashit, at Moses and all the prophets, he expounded to them in all of the scriptures the things concerning himself. Remember, still they did not know that it was him who spoke with them. So he was expounding all of these things concerning himself. And they drew nigh to the village whither they went, and he made as though he would have gone further. But they constrained him, saying, Abide with us, for it is toward even, evening. It was beginning to turn evening. Right, and the day is far spent, and he went in to tarry with them, and it came to pass as he sat at meat with them, he took bread and blessed it and break and gave them, and now after he performs what was done at the commun at the communal meal, at the at the Lord's supper at Gitarat. Right. Once he performed this and he blessed the bread and he break it and he gave it to them, verse 31, and their eyes were open. Now they recognize. And they knew him. Now they knew. They were looking at him. They were talking to him, so forth and so on. They were listening to him, but they did not, their eyes were not open. Now their eyes, so what opened their eyes? At the point that their eyes was open is when they sat down at the Seder. They sat down at the Seder, like the Passover Seder, right? And he took the bread, right? And he blessed the bread. He did the Baruch to the bread. And he broke the bread. And he gave them the bread. And their eyes were open, and they knew him, and he vanished out of their sight. So this is really interesting. Is this part of the resurrection body of the Moshiach, this, 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 this glorious body that the Scripture tells us is of Christ? Is this body actually a fourth or fifth or a higher dimensional density body that, that now the Moshiach, what, the, what even the, the Shroud of Torin, a lot of the speculations also seem to be pointing in that in that sense of this image that was allegedly projected on this cloth was because of a, a high intensity type of um, transfiguration. Now, we already know that Christ was able to transfigure himself when he was on Mount Tabor with Moses and with Eliyahu or Elijah. So it said that his clothing shone like the sun seven times and was bright, and then he was communicating with Elijah and Moses, so forth and so on, for two witnesses, perhaps. But we already know that this manifestation of great light, luminous intensity. Now, this all sounds a lot science fiction. People are like, oh, but is it really that the Bible was so primitive or archaic? or really humanity has been in a primitive or archaic consciousness that only now we look at these things and we say, wait, could it be that they were talking about more advanced reality that we are just beginning to say there's other dimensions? Uh -uh, get out, for real? 
where do you think all our loved ones go when they pass away? What, what, what do you think? You think that's their body there? Where's the spirit? Where does that go? You know, but Christ vanished out of their sight. And they said one to another, did not our heart burn within us while he talked with us by the way? Really, about the way, but by the way. And while he opened to us, he opened to us the scriptures. This is the key thing. This is the key thing. I think a lot of the churchians, this is what I call a lot of the Christian, Christian, you understand? The churchians, they miss this part. You see how much emphasis is given here to the scriptures, beginning at what? Moses. And all the prophets, he expounded. Now, what does expound mean? Please go look this up. Expound does not give a soundbite verse. You understand? No, no, expound is getting deep. You understand? He got deep into that. He made the connections so that now with their listening, as they shimma, as they simmod, as they heard, you understand? They were able now to comprehend and if their wills were obedient to his good influence, you understand, to act on that knowledge and to do and to perform and to practice and to perfect. And they rose up the same hour. Remember, this is now after, after, after he break the bread, after he blessed the bread and, and, and break it and, and, and gave it to them, and they recognized who he was. I don't want to say poof, but, you know, he, he vanished. He was gone. <laughs> now, I'm not going to say he was ghost, but I'm sure they felt like he was, he was ghost to them. He was out of there. You understand? And then they now said to each other, wow, did our consciousness burn? Why was that consciousness burning in them? Because now the flame of Yah, the flame now, because remember what it says in Jeremiah? My word, Jah's word, is a consuming fire. It's, it's a burning fire. His word is fire. Remember what we said a little bit earlier that, that, that the word is, a, is living. Not just the word. The, the word on paper is, is, is not living. This is dead right here. You understand? But when one is with the proper receptivity, you understand, in heart and mind, it becomes a living reality and another dimension of consciousness becomes accessible, is open. You understand? This is what Satan, the devil, and the human accomplices don't want you to get. You understand? Don't want you to recognize. Want to keep you on their lower density because you have the ability to rise to higher dimensions. But they want to keep you at this low, at this low level. You understand? So that you won't recognize the time or opportunity. You understand? Remember what Christ said that some things are in the time and the season is with the Father. It's in His what authority? It's in the Father's authorization. And while and so then they rose up the same hour, returned to Jerusalem, and found the eleven gathered together, and them that were with them, saying, "The Lord Adonai Adoni is risen indeed, for real. He's risen. Well, like we say, John live, His Majesty live indeed. You understand? They say he did. No, he lived. Abba Kedus live indeed, for real." This is the same thing. He, he is risen indeed and have appeared to Simeon, have appeared to Simon. And they told what things were done in the way, what things were done in the way, the truth and the life, and how he was known of them in breaking of bread. Isn't that deep right there? He was known of them, because this is one of the key messages of Yeshua. He was known of them in breaking of bread, and this is connected to the Passover, the Fasica, the Pesach of the Redeemer. He was known to them when he broke that bread. That's the key thing right there. That's what Fasica is about, this, this breaking of bread, you understand, as well as the partaking of, of the wine, because it's a memorial, a metasebia of covenant. You understand? And now the passing over, this passing over is not just coming out of physical Egypt or it's not just concerning the firstborn on that level, but in this time, 2012, there's a very important application, especially as we come up to these, you know, these 
days of tribulation. Know it. They're going to come. There's too much tension and inhumanity and wickedness that needs to be purified. You understand? And man doesn't seem to want to be stopping these things. So the Almighty in his justice and in his graciousness and in his foreknowledge is allowing humanity, you understand, to exercise every imagination. In other words, all the poison that lurk in the mud of their flesh, fleshical being must come out. But with the coming out of that and the realignment of the heavens, this creates tension because the earth is not, the, the, the low vibration is keeping the earth from reaching up to a higher vibration frequency. And in that, there's the shaking. And in that, there's the flipping. You know what I'm saying? I'm not just talking about somebody flipped out, but I, I, I don't know if I want to be on the earth that's, that's flipping around. You understand that the poles are, are shaking. But so be, so be it. Amen and amen. But the key right here is that they knew him through the breaking of the bread. Through the breaking of the bread. Now, if, we, if you would read a little bit further on to the 11, to the 11, and as they thus spake, Yeshua himself stood in the midst of them and said to them, Salam l'ku alaykum ho. He said, Salam kanantadar yehun. He said, peace be to you. Peace be to you. But they were terrified and affrighted. <laughs> you know, it's like, I know, it's Rasta Sari. You know, we speak about, you know, his majesty, and we speak about, you know, um, certain certain things concerning the king of kings. But we have to over over that because if we are we ourselves are gathered together and his majesty is right there in the midst of us, wouldn't that be a little bit I mean, it'd be joy, but but, but a little bit a little bit shocking, but my brothers and sisters, it's as real as that. I mean they, they didn't expect this. You know what I'm saying? Just like they don't expect this either. But as we go on, they were terrified and affrighted and supposed that they had seen a spirit. You know, like a, 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 a spirit. And he said to them, why are you troubled? You know, like, what? You remember he asked them before, he says, what man of communications are these that ye have said one to another as ye walk and are sad? Now he's in the midst of them, and he says, not war be upon you, not judgment be upon you, but he said, peace be with you. And it says they were but but they were terrified and afraid and supposed that they had seen a spirit. And he said to them, why are ye troubled? It's like, ask, let's ask ourselves in this time of all that's going on, why are I and I troubled? Why are I and I troubled? And why do thoughts arise in your hearts? Why, why are strange anxieties? Behold my hands and my feet that it is I myself. Handle me and see, for a spirit hath not flesh and bones as ye see me have. Now that's the key right there. A spirit does not have flesh and bones. You know, that's not what a spirit got. And when he had thus spoken, he showed them his hands and his feet, and while they yet believed not for joy, Strange phrase, right? Why they didn't, didn't my men, why they didn't trust it, why they couldn't admit it for joy. You understand? Um, and wondered. And he said to them, have ye here any meat? In other words, not meat, not flesh, not debtors, but do you have anything to eat? They said, do you have anything to eat? And they gave him a piece of broiled fish. Yes, fish. You understand? and of an honeycomb. And he took it and did eat before him. Now, some Rastafari may get caught up on the fish part. They're like, oh, fish, that's, that's dead because it's, it's, it's alive. But see, we're guided by Moses and the prophets and the Psalms and the teachings of his majesty. One thing we know, it wasn't a piece of pork. It wasn't a piece of, a piece of, a piece of animal. 
so forth is you know like like a blood animal bull or something like that. It's a piece of fish. If you want, if you look at Torah, it, it gives certain stipulations for different animals. You understand? And besides those non-scavenger um, sea sea creatures, fish is considered clean. But today we have a lot of stuff going on and. We ask ones to have caution even in this time. But this is a point about the fish thing and a little of the overzealousness of certain um, rasters, as we would say. And he took it and he did eat before them. And he said to them, These are the words while I spake to you, while I was yet with you, that all things must be fulfilled. Now, he's going to repeat himself. Now notice this, this, this repetition. All things must be all things, not some of them. We can look in the scripture and see that many, but in some areas, some things have already been fulfilled. He says that all things must be fulfilled, which were written in the law of Moses, Musa, and in the prophets, the Nabim, and in the Psalms concerning me, concerning Yeshua the King of Kings and his Christ, concerning him. All these things must be. So in the law of Moses, Torah, so we study Torah, in the prophets, in the beam, and in the Psalms, and more Dawid, concerning me. Then opened he their understanding. Then he opened their, their overstanding, if you please, that they might understand, overstand the scriptures. My brothers and sisters, do you overstand the scriptures? Is your understanding or overstanding open so you comprehend the scriptures? If not, it's time to get to work. You understand? It's time to begin. It's time to get started or to continue. Then he gave them a commission to evangelize, which means to do as we are seeking to do, to spread this good news to those whom you are able and, and willing to. And he said to them, thus it is written, and thus it behooves Christ to suffer and to rise from the dead the third day, and that repentance and remission of hatiyat or sin, missing the mark, should be preached in his name, in Yeshua Sim, in Yeshua's Shem, on in Yesus Sim, in Jesus' name, among all nations. So it doesn't matter what nation, tribe, all of that. All nations got to hear this. You see, the more we don't preach among other nations for a little uh, kind of worldly, secular, racial, and other kind of retarded reasons the more we delay, you understand, our future, the more we delay the age of God's peace and the fulfillment. Beginning at Jerusalem. Now, remember, this connection in Luke and Acts of the Past is also said to be written by Luke chapter, chapter 1 is interesting. And ye are witnesses of these things. So now we get into the ascension of Jesus Christus, verse 49. It says, And behold, I send the promise. I send the promise of my Father. Now, how, how was that interpreted? Did the Father make a promise? Did he make a promise of the Father? Or is it the promise of the Father, actually the fulfillment of the coming of the King of Kings, Kedemawi Haile Selassie? You understand? The promise of my Father upon you. But... Tarry ye in the city of Jerusalem until ye be endued, until you be clothed with power, hail from on high. Not power from down low, not, not, not governmental power, earthly or seclurum power, but it clearly says, for lack of a better word, heavenly power, extraterrestrial power, it says endued, clothed. This is put on Christ. You understand? Is Christ an extraterrestrial? You understand? Put on Christ till you be endued with power from Kalai, Kasamai, from on high. And he led them out as far as Beit Ani, and he lifted up his hands and blessed them. He lifted up his hands and the blessing, and he blessed them. 
And it came to pass while he blessed them, while he was blessing them, he was parted from them and carried up into heaven. Wow. That sounds kind of like extraterrestrial -ish. That sounds like some space stuff. But of course, a lot of y'all believe that there may be aliens and stuff and like Star Wars and Star Trek. But, but when it comes to this, no, it can't be that. He just was flying up in the... Okay. I hear what you're saying, but we recognize that our overstand your eyes have to be open to this. He was carried up into heaven, and they worshipped him and returned to Jerusalem with great joy and were continually in the temple, praising and blessing God. Amen. Now, this is interesting because there's an attitude of Adonanu, of Getachin, that here characterizes this age. This age, oh, the age which is actually closing. One age is closing, another age, like one door is closing, another door is opening. But some people want to stay in that old door, which is closing. And it's not like the door is closing and they're going to be stuck in that age, but the whole age is actually contracting. It's actually, there is no age. There'll be no place. If they can't move into the next one, then they, you're like stuck between the ages, and basically this is, in, anyway, we're not going to go into that too too much right, right now. The, the, this is the preaching right here. We're in the, and we've been in the age of grace, right? And ascended Adonai, and ascended Lord, and ascended Master is blessing, is giving barakat, right, to a Yemiyamin, Yemiyamino, a, a people who are exercising Amen, who are exercising faith with spiritual blessings, not just temporal or earthly blessings, but spiritual blessings. Now, the, 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 the Jewish or the Hebrew age, which was the Old Testament age, it was marked mainly by temporal blessings as a reward of an obedient people, right? According to Deuteronomy chapter uh, 28, verses 1 to 15. But now the curses for the disobedience were fulfilled in the transatlantic slave trade or the Ethiopian holocaust of the Beta Israel or the ethnic Jews and Hebrews in the Americas and the Caribbean. That's the verses 15 to verse 68. Now, in the kingdom age, the spiritual and the temporal blessings, guess what they do? They unite. The spiritual and the temporal blessings, the two sevens, the two sevens clash. And we're moving into that time of the two sevens, the temporal and the spiritual blessings. They unite. Right? There's a unity. Some even say symbolically that's what the the six-pointed star really signifies. And, and there's, there's some truth to that as well. Another point that the Scriptures does for us, it distinguishes three heavens. There are three heavens. We touched on this before, but let's go over this, the footnote here. The first is the lower heavens, which is the region of the clouds. So it says he was taken up in a cloud, so that's the region of the lower heavens. Then secondly, you have the second or the planetary heavens, the heavens of the planets, or really this galaxy, right? And then thirdly, you have the heavens of heavens, which is the abode of God. When we're speaking about the universe or the higher heavens, some even say perhaps um, Sirius, Cyrus, or, 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 or Orion could be a possible origin of this galaxy. We're looking at the Milky Way, you understand? Being reflected in the Nile Valley. So there's a connection there as well. So it's interesting. The Bible gives us the key elements if we would just learn the basics, learn the principles, rightly divide the word. Then a lot of this other kind of metaphysical New Age stuff we're hearing, the facts, that which is truly factual, we'll be able to put into proper context scripturally. And much of it, in faith, access it, you understand, in this age, go, going into the age which is to come. But Fasica, Fasica 
is the key, and we're going to go into a little bit more of that, but the main point right here we wanted to um, demonstrate again is the scriptures is important. The scripture, this is why we just spend some time initially on Easter. Easter, Ashter, Ashter, Ishtaro, Antichrist. Yes, it's found in, 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 in poor Bible translations or poor areas of biblical translation, unfortunately, and even the King James and here in the Schofield Study Bible. But the good thing, the good news is this, that even in the Schofield Study Bible where you find that there, you find that it points to the Passover. You understand? In the marginal note, it'll tell you that that's where the Passover so we observe Passover, Fasica, and not Easter, not Ashtaroth, not Ishtar, not the divas, not the goddesses, not the fertility rituals or, 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 or kinky, weird um, um, metaphysical practices with eggs. You understand <laughs> that most people, they do these things blindly because their eyes are not open. We pray that Yah, that Jah in the name of Jesus Christos, open your eyes and open those others' eyes so they can really see what's going on with those false paganistic and heathen practices. And then we know one thing for sure. They will run from that, you know, like the, like the demonic activity or otherwise, you understand, that's where they belong. But my brothers and sisters, we're going to continue on this. In fact, before we just get off this point, before we get off this point, let's, let's just talk, because we talked about redeem before, and we found some notes right here. Remember, we talked about redeem, and how the Israelites were, were saying, well, 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 you, we thought that Christ would be the one, that he would be the one to redeem Israel. You understand? Even though it doesn't seem, it seemed that Christ was saying that he is Christ, speaking in Christ, but they were still calling him just a prophet. You understand what did Christ say? If you receive him as a prophet, you get a prophet to what? If you receive him as a king, you get a kingly reward, as a lord, a lordly reward. You understand? Christ, a, a Christian reward. You understand? As God, a, a godly, a, a, a son or a daughter of God reward. So according to, you know, according to your receptivity or receptability, so you will, so you will receive him. And if 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 you receive him as as um, as as being unlike he he is, then you may get a reward unlike what you expect too. So if 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 you if if you want to receive him falsely, then then folly is your reward as well. Now, redeem. Let's touch on this a little more. Redeem. Let's just get into a little lesson on this right here. Now, Passover is the first of the three, the three main, main holy days, main holidays, and main holy days, right? Um, what we have here is redeem. Let's touch on redeem. What does redeem mean? So we can understand, because this was the main question amongst them. They wanted, they 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 expected that Christ, that Yeshua, would have redeemed Israel, because they wanted to get back their um, their their status among the nations. They wanted to be, you know, the kingdom. They wanted Israel to have its king again. This is why the chief priests and 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 Pharisees and the rulers they use the cloak and dagger conspiracy against the king of kings against both the father and son, but first against the son and then in 74, 75 against, against Kedus Abba Tach and Abba Kedus. So the same scheme and, con, and, and, cons, and con, conspiracy. You understand? Um, but redeem is the key, right? Redeem. We have redeem right here, right? So we're going to touch on redeem, right? Easter is not redeemable. You know when they say like something's unredeemable, they say like if you buy something you can't you can't get nothing back on that because it's garbage. You know what I mean? It's garbage, basically. But Passover is all about this redemption. It gives it gives it gives us the spiritual foundation of the redemption. Remember what Christ said? Christ said, John truly baptized with water, 
but ye shall be baptized henceforth with the Holy Spirit. You understand? And then we have John saying that he baptized with water, but the one who comes after him will baptize with Holy Spirit and with fire. Remember the, the Emmaus disciples in the house, they were saying, did not our hearts, which is, means the consciousness, the consciousness in man, did not burn within us? When, when he spoke, you understand, that this word, he spoke the word and he op op opened to them the scriptures, which is the word of God. So they were in darkness beforehand. That's why they were sad. That's why they were troubled. That's why they were mixed up and confused. And this is the same thing with us as a people. You understand? And us as those who carry the name of the redeemed, because we are not founded and grounded on the word of truth, which is his word. Remember, he says that, he says, he says the flesh don't profit anything. It's his word. His word is what? Spirit. His word is spirit and his word is life. So when they now, now when, they're, when they're, their consciousnesses were, were opened, you understand, the illumination, you understand, of the word, you understand, came to them. So it was like light shining in darkness. But the darkness don't comprehend the light. Be that as it may, to redeem means to buy something again that has been sold by paying back the price to him that bought it. Now, here's what's interesting about Israel and our people, our ethnic people's condition. You understand? Is that when we were sold into slavery from from scriptural point of view, yes, we were sold for 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 harlot and alcohol and a dog and 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 for nothingness. That's what, you know. That's what the Almighty says. You know, was sold for naught because the price. You understand? Was the price was we sold ourselves to sin and to a curse. You understand? And the Son now spiritually redeemed us once again into the family of God. Now, before the kingdom, which is a spiritual kingdom, to be, could be restored. You understand, could be restored, the kingdom to Israel, a certain process had to work itself out, you understand, in our hearts and minds. It wasn't that God was going to snap his finger and boom, it come about. No, you understand, because we did not get into it because God snapped his finger. You know, this is, this is human heads and hearts, each of us individually and all of us collectively. So when it talks about buying something that had been sold by paying paying the price to him that bought it, it's explaining the principle of redeeming and the principle of redemption. Leviticus 25, 25, Leviticus 27, 20. Secondly, redeem means to deliver and bring out of bondage. Now, here's the key significance with Israel. So the Redeemer, you know the Bible says about the Redeemer coming out of where? Zion. The Redeemer shall come out of Zion. Now, what is Zion? You understand? What is Zion? Is Zion just a place? Are we still thinking only temporally? No. It's not a place, but the new Zion, you understand, is the African Zion, and this equals Ethiopia, you understand, in the person of Haile Selassie and the person of the kingdom of David. So I want you to understand now Christ, Yeshua's redemption on the spiritual, one came to say the metaphysical, the soul state, and the redemption or the restoring, you understand, to Israel, the kingdom. You see, the kingdom has been restored. In fact, they say that Haile Selassie was overthrown. No, the kingdom was handed over to us. The kingdom has been handed over to us as the Rastafari and the faithful Ethiopian Hebrews. And the kingdom is not just limited to those artificial borders, but it has gone global. But there's a war. You see, there's a spiritual warfare. You see, because the evildoers, the thieves, the parasites, and the pirates don't want to give up. So, you know, we have to fight this battle to the very end of the Gentile world dominion and the counterfeit church. So it means to deliver and bring out of bondage those who were kept prisoners by the enemies. Prisoners by the enemies. Now, 
some would say, well, if this is true, right, how come we still are in the condition that we're in? Well, the people have a choice, don't they? You understand? They can make their wills or be into good influences, or they can do, you know, they can do what they like, you know, do what they will. You know, they could say and do as the prayer says, thy will be done, thy kingdom come on earth as in heaven, you see? Or they can choose antichrist route and, and do what thou wilt. You understand? The choice is still theirs. But the opportunity of redemption because of the kinsman redeemer now has come. So this is what we have, the promise of the Father. Remember Christ keeps saying that these things, the kingdom being restored, that's, that's with the Father. That's in the authority of the Father. You understand? The promise of the Father will come. But the first thing you need to do, you understand, is to stay in Jerusalem. You understand? It's to watch and pray. You understand? And to, and to um, be receptive, you understand, to the power, the spiritual power, as the King of Kings even teaches us on the, the spiritual, the importance of spiritual power. He says it's in this world and the world to come. Do we have that speech around? I think it's in... It's, 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 it's in it's in this this um one of one of our books right here, but you can find the speech elsewhere as well. Where his Majesty is something very very interesting, and we want to just um just uh, refer to. He says to make our wills obedient. Page forty six of the Good News of the Gospel of Him, the Good News of Him, Book One. It says to make our wills obedient to good influences and to avoid evil. It's to show the greatest wisdom. In order to follow this aim, one must be guided by religion. Now, let's understand this. The word religion doesn't exist in Amharic. What His Majesty is saying is hymenot. Hymenot means the living faith, the true faith, our, our, our Judeo-Christian faith. You understand? The true faith that's based on the true word and the testimony of God and Christ. Progress without religion or hymenote is just like a life surrounded by unknown perils and can be compared to a body without a soul. So this is what we're witnessing now. We're witnessing a lot of bodies, a lot of, a lot of folks running about, but if they are without the true and living faith, they have lost their soul. So you see with the Psalm 23, so that he restores our soul for his what? For his namesake. What does Christ tell the disciples? To go forward, right, and, and preach this in his name, for his namesake, for the sake of his name. Not for the sake of my name or your name, but for the sake of his name. We do this ministry not for the sake of our name, but for the sake of his name and for the sake of his truth and for the sake of his good news, the good news of the King of Kings and his Christ. Now, continuing, knowing that material and spiritual progress are essential to man. So the man's not saying just, just be holy moly, spiritual, spiritual, up in the sky, up in the air, or in some metaphysical domain also, but physical foundation, metaphysical. Physical, metaphysical, spiritual, material, spiritual. The two are one because you, if you're alive, right, you have flesh, material, but you must have a spirit, even a little bit of spirit, you understand, if you are alive. So the spirit and the material is abiding even in you and I and I. So you, if you get that reality, you should be able to get this reality. If not, you know, I'll, I'll pray for you if, 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 it's, if it's pleasing to the Father. Knowing that material and spiritual progress are essential to man, we must ceaselessly work for the equal attainment of both. Only then shall we be able to acquire that absolute inner calm so necessary to our well-being. Whenever conflict arises between material and spiritual values, whenever, and this, and this happens. I mean, if you, if you don't want to admit it, you're not being honest. If you're not being honest, then that's like a blasphemy against the Holy Spirit on a certain level. You understand, not being honest, because if you're speaking in God and you're seeking to speak to God and you're not being honest with God, then you're not being honest in the Spirit. So you are blaspheming His Holy Spirit, because the life in us really is His, and that life is holy. Think about it. 
You understand? Whenever conflict arises between material and spiritual values, the conscience, you see, the conscience plays an important role. It's like a mediator, a moderator. And anyone who suffers from a guilty conscience, guiltiness rests from their conscience, is never really free from this problem until he makes peace with himself and his conscience. One of the peace with himself and the conscience. Discipline of the mind is a basic ingredient of genuine morality. Genuine, not, not, not pretentious morality, but genuine morality, and therefore of spiritual strength. Spiritual power. This is what Christ was telling the disciples about as Matthew he is reminding us. First thing you need before you think about redeeming Israel, getting the kingship back, so on and so on, you need spiritual power. Because if he gave us the kingdom back, without spiritual power, we can't maintain it because this is the reason why the kingdom was lost to begin with, because of a lack of spiritual power. Spiritual power is the eternal guide, the eternal guide in this world and the world to come and any other worlds that follow. In this life and the life after, for man ranks supreme among all creatures. Why? Because he was created in the image and after the likeness of the true and living God, Ha Elohim Baruchu. Blessed be he. Led forward by spiritual power. Led by what? By how much money we got? By how much how much Facebook friends? No. Led forward by spiritual power, man can reach the summit destined for him by the great creator. Here's an here's a interesting thing for you to um, meditate on. What is the summit? What is the summit destined and intended for us by the great creator? You ever you ask yourself, like, why am I here? Why am I alive? What's the purpose of life? I mean, what, what, what is it really about? You understand? Does God have a purpose? What is that What is that summit that's destined for us by the great creator? Now, if you don't believe or accept as true that there's a creator, well, you have another challenge or problem, you know, and I pray that that problem will be solved, but still the choice is still yours because the evidence is here, there, and everywhere that there is a great creator. There is only one true God, the God and Father of our black Lord and Savior, Yeshua HaMoshiach. Just to give you a, a, an indication or a, a hint, point you in the direction. Since nobody can interfere in the realm of God, you see, so no, no matter what they do, it's like when Bob Marley said, none of them can stop at the time. None of them can stop God's time. Not, not Greenwich time, not the time when you watch, not the time you, you know, not that, that time is, that's part of the twilight zone of time as we touched on briefly. Since nobody can interfere in the realm of God, we should tolerate and live side by side with those of other faiths. How can he say this? Well, very simply, because we should be practicing and perfecting our faith, and if we are, the light will so shine, and they will say, uh, can you tell me about this great hope that you got? I mean, I'd like to know about what you're about. You don't have to push it on them. You don't have to do like, like so many counterfeit ones have done, kill, murder, maim ones to force them in a religion and then say this is God's will. That's all abomination. You understand? In the mystic traditions of the different religions, we have a remarkable unity of spirit. Whatever religion they may profess, they are spiritual kinsmen, while the different religions in their historic forms bind us to limited groups and militate against the development of loyalty to the world community. The mystics have already stood for the fellowship of humanity in harmony with the spirit of the mystics of ages gone by. No one should question the faith of others, for no human being can judge of the ways of God. We say, why the Muslim is a Muslim? Do you have something true to say about Christos? You understand that might enlighten a, a Mohammedan or a Muslim or somebody of another faith? You understand why you, instead of you question their faith, why don't you manifest your faith? Hmm? Let the light shine, you know? Like Moses and, and, and or Aaron and the magicians of Pharaoh. They, they were false, but, but, but they threw down their rods. He threw down his rod to turn into a serpent, right, and back into a rod. They threw down their rod. His rod swallowed up theirs. 
So that is an example of how we should walk in this in this way. It doesn't mean that other faiths don't have their errata or errors. You understand? Know but to question, well, why that person is such and such, you know, is not the approach of the King of Kings and his Christ. However wise or mighty a person may be, he's like a ship without a rudder if he is without God. A rudderless ship is at the mercy of the waves and the wind drifts wherever they take it, and if there arises a whirlwind, it is smashed against the rocks and becomes as if it has never existed. You see, when I read that and I meditate upon that, I think about this time we're in and the, and the accelerating um, manifestations that, that, that are coming upon humanity. And if we are rudderless, you understand, and we just list any way, which way, so forth and so on, then the whirlwind, the whirlwind or whirlwinds that are coming will smash one's physical, psychical, and spiritual so-called ships against the rocks and it'll be like, it'll be like they never existed. Now here is the penultimate, or here's the, here, here's the point. It is our firm belief or our main, it is our firm hymen of living faith that a soul, not a person or what, no, we, he's speaking to the soul, that a soul, a psyche, a, a, a psychological state that's without Christos, that's without the Moshiach, our black Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, is bound to meet with no better fate. Or you could say a bitter fate. The love shown by our God, by our God, Eloheinu, to mankind, to humanity, it should constrain all of us who are followers and disciples of Christ. So his majesty is clearly speaking from a perspective of we as followers and disciples of the Moshiach of Christ to do all in our power to see to it that the message of salvation is carried to those of our fellows who have not had the benefit of hearing the good news. And see, this is the point, that as many of our brothers and sisters all over the world, uh, I mean, as human beings and as potential children of God all over the world, who haven't had the opportunity to hear the, the true good news of the King of Kings and his Christ. Oh, they heard about, you know, they've heard about another Jesus, but they haven't heard of the true Yeshua, our black Lord and Savior. So this is, this is a very important word here, how it connects with redemption, how it connects with this time of Fosica, the time of passing over. Because if you don't pass over, you ain't going to underpass, you're going to pass out. You understand? In other words, it is our conviction that all the activities of the children of men, which are not guided by the Spirit, so as Matthew saying that our, our activities should be guided by what? The Spirit and counsel of God will bear no lasting fruits. They will not be acceptable in the sight of God and therefore go into that new dispensation. You understand? Go into that kingdom age. You understand? They will be burnt out. It will therefore come to naught. It will come to nothingness as the Tower of Babel came to nothingness. So this is also very interesting how the Master is connecting what happened at Babel with this same sort of apostasy and time that we are in currently. The grace of God is eternal. Angels in heaven and the creation on earth sing his praise. We thank the master of the world, almighty God. Power or higher belongs to God. Made God our creator, the helper and guiding light of us all. Grant you his wisdom his wise mind, that you may bear fruits for his glory. As his majesty says, for my part, I and I glory in the Bible. Now, redeem, redemption, redeem the, the age, redeem the zemin. We look into a couple of scriptures I want to give you all. For, for you to look up concerning redeem and redemption. We touched on a few of them already. Excuse me, but this is a couple additional ones. Deuteronomy 7 and 5, Deuteronomy 32 and 6, Luke 1 and 68, 
First Tim, First Timothy two and six, uh, Titus two and fourteen, Ephesians five and sixteen, where it speaks about redeeming the the zemin, redeeming the age. You understand? You know, to redeem the the, the time. It says in the Bible, it says, redeem the time because the days are evil. Actually, it says redeem the age. The age must be redeemed because the 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 days, you understand, the days are, are evil. We have to redeem the fact that this new age is not about Antichrist or so-called Freemasonry or Illuminati or any. They know they can't go through the firewall. But they think that maybe you can, and they can piggyback a ride off of you because their judgment is already locked. It's locked in the heavens. You understand? Know it's it's locked. Maybe they don't know it, but it's it's locked. Now, we talked about the Ethiopia calendar before. How it's seven years um, and about eight months. Seven years, technically seven years, eight months, so-called behind. You understand behind the Western calendar. This might this might um, bring forth or manifest an interesting time. You know when we look at seven uh, twenty twenty twelve, and then we look at the seven month eight uh, seven years eight months. Roughly, roughly we can say um, um, eight years. So we have, is it really 2012 or is it, is it 2020, 2019, 2020? You understand? So if nothing happens dramatically on that time, what will people think? Could it be that people are going to think, judging by the Western calendar, it got to happen then? If it doesn't happen then, people are like, oh, that was more garbage. Nothing. It's just different. It's just global warming. You know, you know what I mean? But then it happens. You, you know, it happens after that, but we see a window. We see like a, there's a window, you understand? And it's these seven months, seven years and eight months. Seven years and eight months, some calculation need to be done. We sum it up to eight years, but the eight months is, 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 a kind of a, is a kind of an interesting calculation which might give us the more accurate 2012, because remember, they are looking at 2012 from a Western calendar. And we've seen where such dates before are highly flawed because of being a Western Gentile calendar. So we have to look at this Ethiopically. But we're moving into the Adis Zemin, the full manifestation. At least we forget May 5th. You understand? At least we forget the May 5th as well. May 5th has not been considered because it's an important alignment in the heavens as well. But we'll touch on that um, going forward. So this point on redeeming, we just want to sum up right here because we went a little bit over on this part of it. But um, and, and yeah, the verse Kenochu uh, Kafuoch Nachuena Zemenu Waju, which is what a Fiasana Sawoch or Ephesians five and sixteen, where it says to redeem the time. Redeem the time is the English. But uh, amharically um, um, speaking, is zemenun waju. The zemen is, is, is what we call an age. And we're moving into a new age. You understand? A new age. We're not going to say the new age is up for grabs. But most folks have been so hoodwinked and bamboozled to think that the new age belongs to Luciferians, the Satanists, the Freemasons and all these other groups, and they're not redeeming the age. You understand? That might be also a part of, of, of the judgment phase, the 42 months or so judgment phase, which is interesting number because that's about three and a half years. So if we look at seven, you understand, seven years, three and a half years, uh, 20 14, 2015, roughly around there, is a very interesting time. We're not saying that nothing is going to happen on 2012, December 21st. 
You understand? But we have to look at the time factor, you understand, in a, in a, in a better context. What we know is that time factor, the time factor we're in right now is a beginning and is an opening, you understand, of these, of these gates, the gates, you understand, of the Adesitu, Adesitu to Jerusalem or New Jerusalem, which has not just one gate, but it has 12 gates for the Beit Israel and for the redeemed. So we have this word redeemed coming up. You understand? If it's redeemable, it is savable. It can be purchased back. It can be reclaimed. But if it's not redeemable, it is basically like garbage. It needs to be thrown out. And this is, this is, this is where we're at. This is exactly um, where we're at. So we must seek to embrace and improve every opportunity of doing good, doing good according to our eyes being open and our understanding of the scriptures, not just doing good to what the world tells us or what is fear-seeming. No, doing good according to the spirit and the counsel of Jah, the spirit and the counsel of God. So Pesach, Fasika, Yekita Ba'al, which is connected with the Feast of Unleavened Bread, is what we're going to continue speaking on, Yah willing, in the next part of this particular teaching, because we thought it was necessary to touch on these two points here about Passover or Easter, you know what I'm saying, and to show the distinction, as well as connect the Redeemer. You understand the Redeemer in the person of the Son, what the Son redeemed, and that which was left in the hand of the Father, you understand, of our Father, even in the person of Edomawi, Haila, Selassie, or Abba Kedus. And then the connection with Zion will become clearer when you look over the Scriptures when it talks about how the Redeemer will come out of Zion. You understand? Because Zion... Just before we go with this, Zion is really the foothold, you understand, or the stronghold of the kingdom of David. Now, we know that the kingdom of David, because the Father says, God says that Israel will never lack a man to sit upon the throne of David, or the throne of Israel, which is the throne of David. The throne of David is the throne of Yahweh, is the throne of Jehovah. The word says this. The throne of David is the throne of Yahweh, of Jehovah. Isn't this interesting? That the throne of David, which is a man's throne, a, 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 a human being, you know, David was a man, and he sat on a throne, but that throne will be called at the same time the throne of Yahweh, the throne of Jehovah. Now, we know that the Son of Christ Christos, Yeshua, did not sit on that throne. That wasn't his mission. He was crucified because they lied against him, saying that he called himself a king and stood a seas and all this garbage and everything like that. But that's how they blasphemed the son. You understand? But we know that uh, that uh, restoration of the kingdom to Israel, which is the kingdom of David, was renewed in Ethiopia. And this is where we get the connection now with the true Zion, the true Zion, the true Zion. And we'll touch on Zion a little bit more as well, because Zion now, connected with Ethiopia, is also connected with, before we go, the, connected with the Ark. So we have the Ark of the Covenant. Now, remember, he made a covenant with David, you understand, concerning a kingdom. Now, note, note this as well. Israel, when it was united, that means all the 12 tribes and the two major portions, Israel, the northern 10 tribes, and Judah were connected as one. But we understand from the history that they split. Israel... You understand the ten tribes was was um, some say destroyed some as a as a, as a as a homogenous entity, but they were scattered. They became the lost sheep 
of Israel, the ten tribes. Judah remained, but Zion, which links with the Ark of the Covenant in Ethiopia, we call the Ark Zion. So that's the connection with Ethiopia. That's the connection with the kingdom of David. That's connection with this, this covenant that also fulfills Psalm 68, which, which actually is a tabled psalm. Psalm 68, when it says, let Jah arise, let his enemies be scattered. If you go to um, Numbers, that's exactly the protocol for the Ark of the Covenant. When the Ark of the Covenant is going in procession, that's exactly what Musa, the head of the fraternal order of the Beta Israel, the Lewawi and the Levites, that's exactly the key word. There's certain key word, like, like in an army or military, there's certain code word, password. That's one of the passwords, let God arise, let his enemies be scattered, let those that hate him flee before his face. You understand? And then we have that in the significant psalm that connects Zion, the Ark of the Covenant, with Ethiopia, with the kingdom of David, and with his imperial majesty, and thus, vis-a-vis, -vis, with I and I, the lost, once lost, but now found Beta Israel in the West. So now, this is what brings it full cipher on that level. But redeem, and redeem, I think, is significant. Because when we say his, his majesty is the kindred redeemer, some think, well, what about the Son? What about Jesus Christ? Remember, the Father and the Son is one, right? And, and if we receive the Son who was sent by the Father, the Christ said, we all are one. That's Tawahido. That's also found in Zion, Ethiopia, Kingdom of David, and the basis of this foundation of the Ark of the Covenant Christianity that we know as the Ritit Hymenot, or the true faith of we as Ethiopian Hebrews. Now, we're going to touch a little bit more on Fasica. So stay tuned, brothers and sisters, for that one. And once again, we say Shalom Rastafari.